Jin, would be great if you could introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you are doing. Okay, uh, my name is Jitin Singh Nirmala, and I work with uh, children in orphanages and street shelters across the country. So, um, I, back in college, I started an organization called Make a Difference, which today um, works with children across 23 cities. And what we primarily do is provide the one thing that children in shelter homes don't have, which is a family. We try to understand the best and get them to become the family for our children. So what is your background? What did you study? Oh wow, I, 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 where do you come from? Yes, I'm from, I'm a Malayali, I come from Kerala, uh, which is the southern state of India, and uh, I did my Bachelor of Commerce. That's, okay. that's what I studied. So what was the turning point when you said, I'll have to do this, what I'm doing? Yeah, uh, it, it was definitely my experience when I went to an orphanage for the first time. Uh, I was in the orphanage and I spent, as, when I started spending time with children, I kind of started realizing how they really did not have a way out of the system. The, the orphanage was a part of a big vicious cycle that they were stuck in, where there's a very high chance that they will drop out, in fact 95% chance that they will drop out before the age of 18, of, drop out of school and uh, they'll go back to the streets where they came from, from where they were supposed to be rescued in the first place. So knowing that kind of gave me the power, the, the, the willpower to kind of change that. What are the reasons why the drop out rate, the chances that they drop out and say 98 Why no, are they? So what are the specific reasons? This, it's it's very simple and straightforward. Uh, it's the lack of family support that they have. That is, there is no no single person in the orphanage who is looking after them, asking them, okay, friend, did you study today? What did you study today? Have you prepared for that exam? And also make them feel that you know what education is important. So the total lack of any such support structure kind of makes it inevitable. Uh, because in our families, what happens is that there's a parents who are constantly telling you about the importance of education. There's also your friends and friends, which is your, your seniors who are getting into great colleges, so you want to be like them, or your amazing uncles and aunties who, who you are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. But in an orphanage, that doesn't happen. In an orphanage, it is basically you are stuck in those four walls and you have very little exposure to what's happening outside. And the little exposure you have is to your own seniors who have themselves dropped out of school. And they will come back and say, you know what, there's no point really studying for maths and science because at the end of the day you're going to be a rickshaw driver and you don't really need all this stuff. So how did you tackle the problem? I mean, it's one thing to see the problems. Yeah. How did you tackle it? The, uh, we, we, we tried to, we, we, we tried multiple things, but finally the one thing that worked was that can we recreate that, that environment, that parental concern. So we kind of really broke down what are the different values that our parents add to our life or the community adds to a person's life. Starting from the basic value system the child has, the basic work ethics the child has, the belief in himself the child has, the safe social space that the child has, the aftercare support. Once he leaves a shelter home, something to fall back on, that confidence. So all the things that a parent provides, then we identified volunteers, high potential young people who are able to tack, provide these things for children at different stages. So identifying what stage they need what most and hence kind of re-establish. The only thing that we did was kind of connect to the community back to the child. What uh, We believe that a child becomes an orphan not when his parents die but when the community give, gives up on them. And that to some extent happened in our communities because especially in urban communities where people for some reason believe that the responsibility of a child living next door is not mine, but somebody sitting in Delhi. It's a government's responsibility to take care of him and not mine. And we kind of just broke that myth and said, you know, you know what, if there's a child suffering in your community, that's your fault and you have to do something about it. And the moment that connection was made, that is what, that, that's a strength that drives man because there is an individual who cares for another individual and that's what keeping the whole system going. So you said earlier that you tried a couple of things which didn't work. So. What didn't work? Uh, multiple things. So, so uh, one of the big things that did not work is just trying to teach them. Because the first realization that we, the first thing that we tried was what we thought was that you know what children don't children don't know English. If you teach them English really well, they're gonna flourish amazingly as amazing human beings, right? Uh, we had a lot of interesting data to back it up. We said your employability goes up by 400 percent if you can communicate in English. English is a global language. You know all those kind of things. But then later, we realized that English is just one small part of the problem. That is, English is a byproduct of the whole problem. The problem itself is something much larger than that. 
and the problem, the larger problem is that the child is affected by multiple things. The child is affected by the government, by the various policies that the government has. The child is affected by the shelter home that he lives in. The child is affected by the community that he's living, being part of. He's still continually affected by his parents, some kind of relationship that he continues to have. There are all these dimensions to the problem the child is actually facing. And unless we are tackling those, if you do not, by just handling English, you just, it's more of a band-aid than actually a real solution. What else didn't work? What, oh, good, you're pushing me on this. Good. <laughs> uh, another... Because these are learnings for, yeah. these are learnings for other people, sir. Absolutely. So, uh, another big thing that we thought was that, uh, we thought we, we'll, be, we'll be loved by parents. We thought, you know what, oh my god, parents will be like, you know what, my kids had no purpose in life and now you've given them purpose, you guys are awesome, we'll, you know, we, we, you know, we'll, we'll donate you generously. And that was a big mistake because parents kind of saw us as a threat. Uh, and, and to a great extent, I believe uh, parents are scared that the children become passionate about something because if they get really passionate about something, they lose their interest in education. And at the end of the day, every parent wants the children to be focused on education than anything else. So young people who come to MAD, they become extremely passionate about what's going on. And they become, for the first time in their lives, according to me, they wake up. They wake up and they see this extreme energy in them to do a lot more than that, that they used to do normally. People used to go to bed or didn't have the energy to go stay up beyond 9 o'clock. We'll work till 12, 30, 1 in the night because now they've found a newfound purpose. That scares people to a great extent. But also the, it has changed now. Now it's 7 years down the line, parents who were initially skeptical have seen that after 2 years, the child is not the same person anymore. The child has grown so much because at the end of the day, the child is going in front of another child and telling him why it's important to study, why it's important to take care of yourself, why you know, a lot of things that the parent was doing to himself. And you can see that self-management, the tremendous change in young people. So uh, the what did not work was that we did not anticipate the kind of pushback that we would get from the parents. And uh, we're slowly still working on, on kind of resolving that. How do you scale this entire project? You told us earlier that it's already now in 80 villages. Or uh, it's, it's, it's running in 80, 80 community, 80 how, orphanages. How did you scale? How, how did you make at least a little movement out of it? Yeah, so uh, I was running, I was kind of riding the winning horse, to be honest. I mean, it was not, when we started MAD, the plan was not to scale it out across the country. But as I said, um, it, young people in India are looking for an opportunity to do something about all the evil that they see around. They know that things around are not great. It's not fantastic. And they're tired of being told by their family, by their teachers, by their friends that there's nothing you can do about it. That all you can do is currently mind your own business, study, because all this is the government's job and the only thing you need to do is go and cast your vote. When Matt had an alternate, for the first time in their lives, Matt had an alternate story to say. We said, you know, you can do something today. In fact, we used to go to colleges and say, you know, when you turn 30, you'll realize that you'll never be rich, you'll never be famous, and you'll never get married to Angelina Jolie. Till then you have hope. And that was a very important thing because young people were waiting. They thought, you know what, we need to wait uh, and you know, settle down, get a job, get married and have kids before we start helping. But we said, no, if you don't do it today, it'll never happen. And we gave them examples of any big movement that happened outside. It was not by 50-year-old people who have settled down in life. It was by young people. Any movement is the energy comes from young people. And if you don't do anything substantial to your life today, there's nothing going to happen after that. And that kind of got them out of their pens. You being one of these new generation, <laughs> uh, what would you mark as the biggest challenges for the young generation here in India? Um, being in the bubble. Because uh, this, is, this is why I like the Milton Foundation so much. Which is basically, um, before the age of 18, I have never been in an orphanage. Even though there's an orphanage, there's 15 orphanages in my city. Right? I've never been in an orphanage. I've never interacted with people outside my social circle. I've only interacted with me, my family, friends, and their friends. Right? That's it. And that has basically created a warped vision of what the world is. And that is, is, is a big challenge. I and mean, parents don't want their children to get out of it to a great extent too. Because what's out there is also, you know, it is unnerving. And uh, the bubble has to burst sometime, right? Fine, you can keep, you know, preserve, preserve it until you're 10 years old. But after 10 years old, if you don't break it, unless you really see what the real world is, um, you, you, you don't start living yet. And I feel that uh, my generation, I mean, my generation in India, we have a big crisis. 
uh, it could be a crisis or an opportunity, which is a lack of purpose. Our parents had a strong sense of purpose because they had to find a job and support a family. Uh, if they lose their job, their family will suffer. We are not really in the same space. We, it's, it's not difficult for us to get a job. And even if I stop working today, I know I can maintain my standard of living for the rest of life just like this. So, I kind of lost my purpose. On, so what is my real purpose in this life? We have kind of struggling to find that. And the only way you can find that is by venturing outside your circles, seeing other communities, seeing people, interacting with people totally different from you, understanding what their challenges are. And the ability to do that, I'm not still sure how many young people have the opportunity to explore. The moment we can do that, I think that's, that's a big challenge. Because the moment that happens, the youth are going to awaken. And there's going to be a big movement, for sure. Do your parents still love you? Uh, <laughs> trick question. I got kicked out two months, two years back. So, but so after that things have been better. Yeah, out, huh? yeah. So, but after that things been so as long as we don't have to meet each other on a day-to-day -day basis, I think it's uh, it's still sustainable. It's a sustainable relationship. But um, they still have their, you know, I still don't fall into the typical, which is you know, my son has done his engineering and is in the U.S. doing working for Microsoft, right? That's the. The, my, the, my narrative is a lot more complicated. Okay, fine, he finished his graduation. Now he's working with children in orphanages. You know, all those kind of And, and literally, uh, there, are volunteer, there are people, there are 23 people working full-time in this company, in the organization that I'm working in. And uh, their parents are literally worried about getting their children married off. Like, nobody will want to marry people like you. So, you know, parents have very genuine concerns. But um, that's also because they are thinking about it from their perspective, which was 30 years back where a steady job was a big deal and the kind of environment was in such a way that you know security was too important for us we don't feel that need and we need to thank our parents for that because they created the platform for us to do this but now that we can do this let's might as well do it instead of trying to just follow the same stuff our parents tried to do do you have an ongoing conversation with your parents on this or is it an issue you yeah, rather keep we, behind we, yeah yeah we just stay away from it as much as possible so when we have conversations it, you know, it's, it's, it gets yeah. it's ugly <laughs> You were talking, sorry if I begin too personal, I was just yeah. curious. <laughs> uh, you were talking about a movement, yeah. a young people's movement. Do you see this movement in India? And yeah. how does it manifest? What so so, so um, it's, it's basically simple. When young people need something greater than themselves to really find, find their space. You know, uh, and I'm, yeah, okay, cool, let me rephrase that, That's, that is kind of not well put. I feel that um, our generation are like rebels without a purpose, right? I mean, you know, we have rebels without a cause. We have, uh, we have passion, we, we, see this, we, we want to do something, there's a lot of energy, but we're not sure what exactly that is. And the reason we are not clear what exactly that is, is because we're not sure what's going on around us, and we're not confident to actually step out of our, you know, uh, step out of our comfort zone. The moment that happens, what's going to happen is more young people will start working in the social space. They'll say, you know what, I want to do more about things that's going on around me. So the day young people start realizing that my responsibility to my community is more than just voting, right? That's when the movement will start because then there are already organizations like ours which is ready and waiting for them to come on board and do things. And as, as I said, any change that needs to happen, young people need to be at the back of it. And young people are awakening right now. The moment the bubble is burst, and it's going to happen soon, we are going to have a huge movement of young people who actually care about things that's larger than themselves. Who is funding that? Uh, multiple funders. We have a very diversified funding system. Um, primarily because if you're a youth movement, you should be funded by young people. Right, so uh, that's the idealistic situation. So sooner or later, hopefully in the next three years, we want to ensure that we're funded predominantly, 90% by young people. Um, currently, Google is one of our funders. Um, Starbucks is one of our funders. We have quite, uh, Michelle Obama is one of our active supporters. Um, but uh, a majority of the money is also coming from the community. So what do we do? We empower the community to take care of themselves. So we don't just train them on how to take care of the children, but also how they can raise funds to take care of the children. So each of our communities are self-sustaining communities and we normally take a 10% cut and on the support that we provide so we get the money to sustain ourselves but the, most of the funding is happening at the community level. So how are you how are you related here to Melton Foundation? You mentioned uh, it earlier that it was yeah. kind of 
how I related, I got invited for a session. That's that's basically how I am related. I have a good friend, Sartaj. Uh, he is he's is been a Melton fellow. So I know the so I, I judged the fellowship through him and he's an inspiring character, so I thought definitely worth being part of. So what is your takeaway of today? What do you take back home? It's 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 this. I mean um, I, I guess I, I think there's a theme to what I'm trying to say because that's probably what it's kind of coming to me all throughout this thing, which is that they're doing exactly what young people need right now, which is they, they're breaking the bubble. They're taking them outside, but they're also doing it in a very different way than the way we're doing it. We do it pretty hardcore way, which is we take them to a shelter home and say, this is the reality, now deal with it, now learn how to cope up with these children. Right? And children, volunteers struggle. But here I feel that they have a lot of tools to kind of make sense of what's going on. There's a lot of dialogues, intercultural dialogues, and I feel the level of empathy is a lot higher as a fellow here. So um, my big takeaway is that Young people need also tools to engage when they are engaging with these, a different community. How can they empathize with them better? How can they understand them better? How can the di dialogues be not just unidimensional, but you know, uh, by, on both, to both directions? That's a big thing. The very last question would be, uh, you will be using the word we quite often. Yeah. Uh, what does we mean for you? What does it stand for? Hmm, interesting. I mean, you were using it like, <laughs> yeah, so there is not, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, I mean, this is We Magazine here, so. Yeah, so you need Sorry. to ask the question, yeah. No, it's, 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 it's um, so for me, when I say we, to a great extent, I mean mad, right? Um, we, we did not, we started together, which was not by myself, right? And then there were always young people who were constantly around, there's never, we have never really faced the big challenges that normally a startup face because there's so many young people who are already there, right? So um, I feel I'm speaking for them. I'm speaking for those young Indians who actually believe that it is possible to create a better future for the vulnerable children of India, right? And we all believe in the same thing and we're all in the same thing together. And by we, I mean all of them. Thank you. Most welcome. Thanks a lot.